Hello, Midwestern Marks viewers. Eddie Liger here with part two of our book guide summary and analysis of Friedrich Engel's Origins of the Family, Private Property, and the State. Today we'll be discussing chapter one of this book, which is titled Prehistoric Stages. Uh, this follows part one of our book guide, which discusses the introduction and the prefaces uh, that come before the first chapter. But before we dive into the book, I want to talk about a couple ideas I have for this series going forward. Um, so my first idea is to create a, a singular podcast or maybe a little mini-series with Carlos, uh, where he looks at a few of these reading guides and then um, compares them or critiques them with his current research that he's done in Marxist ecology and Marxist anthropology, uh, which he's been studying very thoroughly for the last two years, uh, which is something I haven't had time to do. Um, so we've talked a lot about updating uh, the, the works of Marx and Engels based on updated scientific information. Um, but as Mao said, no investigation, no right to speak. Um, and I have not uh, thoroughly investigated modern anthropology as much as I would like to. Uh, so I think a little mini-series or a podcast with Carlos um, investigating uh, what modern anthropology has to say about Engels' uh, late 19th century anthropology text uh, would be interesting and informative for everyone. Um, so look for that coming soon. Uh, and I also want to add a segment at the end of these videos answering comment questions or even responding to criticisms. So please let it fly in the comment section below. Um, I'm going to respond to a couple comments that were left on the last video, uh, but I'd love to get more questions uh, or more criticisms from any of you. But without further ado, let's get into Chapter 1 of Origins, uh, where Ingalls is going to be looking at the prehistoric stages of development uh, that were developed by anthropologist Lewis Henry Morgan in his book Ancient Societies, um, and comparing or, or, or looking at Morgan's outline of how society developed um, and comparing it to the advancements in production uh, which came about in these societies during these, these time periods in, that Lewis Henry Morgan is looking at, infusing Lewis Henry Morgan's work with dialectical and historical materialism. So let's get into the summary. So Lewis Henry Morgan's Ancient Societies breaks prehistory into three main epochs, savagery, barbarism, and civilization. And savagery, barbarism, and civilization are going to be divided into three further subcategories based on the level of productive development within those epochs. Uh, these subcategories range from low to medium to high. Uh, so by example, we'll look very closely later on at the low, medium, and high stages of development within the epoch of barbarism. Um, the epoch of savagery is a little bit hard to look at because there's very little historical record due to the low level of productive capacity that humans had at the time. Um, so keep that in mind as we're going forward. Also keep in mind that some of these terms are outdated. Uh, since Ingalls wrote this book and during the time Ingalls was writing this book, uh, it was a tactic of the exploiting classes to call certain groups of people savages, um, and it's often used as a racist tactic uh, to maximize or justify exploitation and pillage. Um, it's, a, it's a tactic of old school European raci uh, racism. Uh, but Ingalls is a materialist, um, and materialists don't believe that any group or race of people are inherently different from others. Uh, we believe societies differ uh, based on their material environments, uh, their material relations, and the level of productive development within that society. Material factors uh, influence differences in society, not factors like race. So. Although Ingalls is using some outdated terms here, which probably stem um, from the scientific racism and the old school European racism that he was surrounded by at the time, um, his, his materialist ideas here are actually the antithesis to a lot of the racist ideas that are being promoted at the time by Ingalls' European intellectual contemporaries. What matters most for the materialist, for Ingalls, is how human society's productive capacity changes, or their ability to produce their means of existence, um, and how this affects and changes the structures of society. So as humans can more easily produce the things they need to survive, how does this change various structures within society like the state and family? 
Um, and this is what Engels is referring to when he talks about the advancement of society through various stages. Uh, he's not following along with these old school ideas of European racism um, and faster development of certain societies based on inherent qualities within those people. Um, it's all based on material factors, which are largely random. Um, and also understand that Ingalls was drawing from what he had available to him at the time, the scholarly work that was available at the time, which was in the late 19th century, which meant digging through a lot of whack European race science. Um, and these stages of development, which Ingalls is talking about, belong to Morgan and the field of anthropology before Morgan, more so than they belong to Ingalls. Um, so I think it's important to be careful in this book to mention which ideas and which concepts specifically come from who. Uh, and this is something that was pointed out by a comrade named Wiley uh, in the Patreon book club. Uh, he caught me when I wasn't being clear about uh, what concepts had been developed by David Graeber versus Marx. Um, so I think it's important, too, when we're, we're talking about even these old ideas, you know, what concepts were actually developed by Ingalls, uh, what concepts were developed by Morgan or, or anthropologists before him, you know, and, and which of these concepts are sort of being borrowed by Ingalls and which concepts are being developed by him on his own. But with that said, let's get into a quick breakdown of the different stages of development, which are going to be analyzed much more closely in later chapters. Uh, so the first stage of development, the first epoch, is savagery. Uh, this is Lewis Henry Morgan's first stage. Uh, so we're going to start with the subcategory, lower stage. So we're looking at the lower stage of the epoch of savagery, according to Lewis Henry Morgan. Um, so the leading theories at the time said that humans in this stage ate nuts and berries while living in and amongst the trees. Modern anthropology has largely confirmed that humans originated in Africa, um, and there's much scholarly debate as to the existence of societies outside of Africa at this time. Um, but what Ingalls is going to say here is what allows humans to first separate themselves from animals at this point of, of society's development is they're beginning to use tools and develop language. Um, so this is how humans are able to separate themselves from the animal kingdom. They are able to use tools, um, which allow them to change how they interact with the environment, uh, which causes societies to develop very quickly. Um, so you see from the very beginning, the very, 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 very beginning, before humans even exist, um, what's leading to societal change is changes in humans productive capacity their ability to use tools their ability to produce their ability to interact with the environment around them is what causes changes in the structure of society or as Ingalls is saying here or theorizing here what causes humans to come about in the first place so that's the low stage of savagery which brings us to the mid stage uh, what characterizes the mid stage is the use of fire um, this allows for human societies who were mostly living near water sources at this time uh, to cook fish. Um, being able to cook fish allowed easier production of means of existence, the things humans needed to survive, foot like food, um, and it allowed human societies to be more independent of weather conditions and the location of the group. Uh, so they could become less nomadic as a result and societies could settle more um, as long as it was along a river or a coast. Uh, because human societies were still largely tied to water sources for producing their means of existence. Because all they really knew how to, how to get at this time were fish um, and they knew how to cook those fish. Uh, at this mid-stage, there were rough and unsharpened tools that were developed, and we have the first development of weapons, meaning clubs and spears, which brings us to the higher stage of savagery, which is where the bow and arrow is invent invented. Um, the invention of the bow and arrow allows for hunting to become a regular job in society for producing the means of existence. It allows human societies to mo more thoroughly control their food supply, leading to the first settled villages. Um, and at this time, we also see the development of weaving and sharpened tools come about. Um, so we start with humans developing tools, which allows them to separate from the animal kingdom. Um, and then we end this epoch of savagery with humans developing bow and arrows, which creates a new job in society, a new mode of labor for humans to do, which produces the means of existence, aka hunting.
So this brings us to Lewis Henry Morgan's second epoch, his second stage of societal development, barbarism, which comes about with the development of pottery, which might be familiar to anybody who's played the Civilization game, Civilization 5 or 6. Once you develop pottery in that game, your civilization can move on to the next stage. So uh, I, I like that game. I think they based themselves off Lewis Henry Morgan's ancient society. So shout out to them. But anyways, going into the subcategories of barbarism, at the lower stage, uh, clay can now be hardened with fire. Um, so at this time, you see the raising of animals and the cultivation of plants begin for the first time. Uh, Eastern societies had more diverse animal raising, um, and they focused on the cultivation of grain, whereas Western societies had a lot of llamas that they were raising um, and focused on the cultivation of corn. So these differences were obviously based on material differences in environment or differences in geography. Um, it was just easier to grow corn and raise llamas in the West because that was what was available and that's what the soil could grow. Um, whereas in the East, they had more diverse animals that they raised and more heavily focused on the cultivation of grain. Um, so yes, that brings us out of the lower stage and into the middle stage. So at the middle stage in the East, they began to domesticate animals. Um, whereas in the West, they began to develop irrigation, you know, the ability to build uh, basically plumbing or water supplies, which would bring water from one area to another area in order to water the crops. Um, and this came about with the ability or the development of the ability to bake adobe bricks. And, and adobe bricks could obviously be used for building structures, such as um, um, irrigation structures, bringing water from one place to another. Uh, so these developments in production allow for societies to settle in small villages, uh, now cultivating small gardens while also hunting and raising small stocks of animals in order to produce their means of existence. So Ingalls says the development of these various societies was cut short, not enhanced uh, by the conquest of European societies that would come later uh, with colonization as Europe began uh, pillaging and trying to increase their own wealth by colonizing and conquering others. Um, so Ingalls stating this, that, that uh, English colonialism and English or, or European colonialism and European world dominance uh, cut short development, that would have been going in the face with a lot of his intellectual contemporaries uh, who were obviously English chauvinists arguing that English colonialism and imperialism was good and that it brought civilization to all the world. Um, Ingalls is pretty clearly challenging that idea right here. Uh, so various nomadic societies in what we call the cradle of civilization near the Tigris and Euphrates uh, began to raise animals that could produce milk and, and began to overall just develop uh, their ability uh, to raise livestock and use that to produce their means of existence. Um, so this is often pointed to as the real beginning of society, where society really took off. Uh, but Ingalls points out here that this area, Mesopotamia as we call it, is only became the cradle of society due to developments in production that came about in earlier societies that allowed for agriculture to become possible in this area, for agricultural techniques to develop in this area. Uh, meaning, if you had previous societies who did not know agriculture, these hunter-gatherer societies, uh, they would not have found Mesopotamia to be particularly inhabitable. Um, but with the development of production that happened over time, which allowed for agricultural techniques to develop, um, it allowed for Mesopotamia to basically be a perfect place uh, for agriculture to take off, leading for humans' ability to produce their own means of subsistence to take off, leading to societies in general taking off. Um, Ingalls also says here that some societies at this time become more intelligent than others uh, because they eat more meat. And that's possibly the most blatant example of an argument in this book that's been disproved by modern science. Um, there are no societies that are smarter from eating more meat. Um, but uh, the main focus of Engels' argument is that uh, there's a faster development of productive methods at this time 
um, which is largely due to luck based on the geographic locations of various societies and the level of productive development at that time. And this is what allows some societies to develop uh, their productive forces faster than other societies. Not these, you know, racist European ideas that some societies are just inherently better than others. It all has to do with your material environment um, and, and the, the level of productive uh, development that that each society has. So while there are tinges of European racism that do seep into this section, we also see dialectical materialism, uh, Engels' method that he's using here, as the antithesis to these uh, old school theories of scientific racism. See, Engels is saying it's not the superiority of any race or any skin color or any people of a certain region. It's all based on the material relations existing uh, within those societies. The relations between people, the relations people had to the means of production, the tools, um, and the relation that people had uh, to the environment a lot around them, um, and, and how those relations affect uh, those societies' abilities to produce what they need to survive. Um, and, and all of these material factors are what are going to influence or allow some societies to develop their productive forces faster than others, not any inherent qualities within those societies. It's uh, dialectical and historical materialism is the ultimate debunk of racism, these idiotic ideas of race science that some societies or some groups of people are just inherently better. It's all based on material factors, and those who were those societies that were able to develop much faster, uh, it was mostly due to the environment that they were in and luck. So now moving on to the higher stage of barbarism. At the higher stage of barbarism, we see the melting of iron becomes possible for the first time. Um, at this time, we also see language for the first time being used to record history. Uh, record keeping comes about for the first time. Uh, Ingalls says this higher stage of barbarism is the area where the most productive advances happen thus far. Um, and this is definitely true, uh, but it's also the era with the most existing evidence of what societies were like thus far uh, due to the development of writing. So these, these uh, societies previous to the higher stage of barbarism, there's a lot of speculation that has to be done because there wasn't uh, anything written down because language and written history hadn't been developed. Um, so once we get to the higher stage of barbarism, there's much more information available to us because human societies at that time had developed writing, so we can read what they wrote. So along with that, uh, the development of melting iron also allows for iron plows, which are driven by animals, and this leads to large-scale agriculture. Assisting in this development of large-scale ag were the newly developed iron axes, um, and these iron axes were used to clear large areas of forest in order to make room for more pastures and farmland, more large-scale agriculture. Uh, so this increase in large-scale ag, or this implementation of uh, large-scale ag, leads to a massive increase in the population as, they can much, as societies can much more easily produce what they need to survive, their means of existence, um, and it also leads to a concentration of the population as these societies are able to become more settled. Um, they become less nomadic as they no longer have to chase their source of food around, but begin to produce their food themselves through interacting with the environment purposefully, through using tools um, to mediate their relationship with the environment. Um, so Ingalls says that he's pulling um, a lot of this information, getting a lot of evidence about these productive developments um, through reading poems from Homer, um, the famous Greek poet, or the writings of Caesar, you know, the Roman emperors at the time. So at this point, Ingalls has taken the outline of societal developments that was laid out by Lewis Henry Morgan, and he has traced these along with the developments in production that were seen during each of these epochs that uh, Lewis Henry Morgan lays out. So he's infused this sort of prehistorical outline laid out by anthropologists with dialectical and historical materialism. He's taken each of the epochs laid out by Morgan and, and said, what is produced in this epoch? How is humans' ability to produce changing in this epoch? And later he's going to look at how this affects uh, various different elements of society within these epochs. Um, so you'll notice that Ingalls only focuses on the prehistoric periods here, meaning savagery and barbarism, uh, the, the periods before civilization. 
Um, and civilization will be discussed in great depth later um, in this book, as well as the core works of Marx, such as Capital Volumes 1 through 3. Capital Volumes 1 through 3 is all about um, a historical and dialectical analysis um, of developments of, of uh, societies within this epoch of civilization. But, yep, chapter 2. So yeah, that's basically it for this chapter, though. Um, chapter 2 we are going to discuss the family forms corresponding to each period and their developments. Um, so in this, in this chapter, Ingalls took these epochs, these historical time periods laid out by Lewis Henry Morgan. He said, here's how production changed at this time. Here's how humans' ability to produce their means of existence changed at this time, which led to these changes in the various epochs and, and which led to various changes in how human societies could organize themselves. Um, but what he's going to do in chapter two is go more in depth and discuss the different family forms which corresponded to these different periods. Uh, so now that he's discussed the different productive developments within each period, he's going to discuss the family forms which vary uh, based on each time period and how these family forms are interrelated with the changes in production that were discussed in chapter one. Um, so you can see how Ingalls is kind of building on this argument, uh, starting with the outline that Lewis Henry Morgan laid out, um, first adding, you know, what was produced at this time, you know, and what was changing in humans' ability to produce. Um, and then he's going to add to that what were the family forms at this time. And later he'll add how did private property develop at this time? How did the state develop at this time? Um, and he develops this uh, very dialectical argument um, of how human societies developed uh, based on the level of productive development um, and how this affects all the interrelated elements of society and how it causes those elements to change, elements like the family form, the state. All right, I'm talking too long. This is basically the end of chapter one. Uh, let me know if you have any comments. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty short chapter. Um, it could be a little complicated if you don't get the basic idea of dialectical materialism and this basic idea that that humans' ability to produce and, and production in human society is what drives changes in, in um, society and drives changes in the different elements of society. Um, but for those of us who are just starting out um, with understanding Marxism, hopefully this has been a good explainer. Right. Hopefully going all the way back, you know, to when humans first separated themselves from the animal kingdom, you know, and saying that this separation happened because humans developed tools, uh, because humans developed their ability to produce uh, more so than other animals. Um, this shows how production has been affecting and changing the various elements of human society since the very beginning. Um, so, yeah, that's all, though, for our summary of chapter one. Um, I'm excited for our discussion of the family forums in chapter two, uh, but let's finish with our last segment of the day, responding to various comments from the previous video. So in the last video, I did not announce that we were going to be doing this segment where I respond to viewer questions, um, but there were still a few questions left that I think are worth responding to. Uh, so the first one comes from Lee Hayes, who says, This sent me down a Google hole, looking for anthropologists' current ideas on the origins of the nuclear family. I don't know. Well, good work, Lee. I would encourage you to continue going down those rabbit holes. Uh, Marx and Ingalls themselves never shied away from addressing any new arguments or any new information that was gleaned scientifically. Um, they use this new information or these arguments uh, to, to be critical of their own works or to update their own works. Um, or they would use their own works to address these new arguments. Um, because we always have to be aware that bourgeois ideologues, ideologues for the ruling class, will purposefully dilute or confuse the conversation um, in their own interests. Uh, so there are, you know, bourgeois anthropologists who will purposefully push a certain narrative um, because it helps their own material interests. So it's good to keep that in mind, um, but it's never good to shy away from any information, you know. Uh, it's never good to run from the evidence. Uh, so continue going down those Google rabbit holes. Uh, continue researching. Um, don't just stick uh, with the book Origins. It's a great text, uh, but use other information sources, other anthropologists uh, to continue adding to your, um, your knowledge base when it comes to this subject. Uh, good job, Lee. Two thumbs up.
And as for the development of the nuclear family, that's obviously what we're going to be discussing in the next video, um, at least what Ingalls uh, says about that. Uh, so hopefully that will answer some of your questions, and uh, hopefully you'll get a broader outline um, as we go through these videos, or, or not a broader outline, but a more concise, uh, more clear outline of what Marxist anthropology looks like as we go through these videos, uh, which will make it easier for you to compare Marxist anthropology to modern anthropology. So again, good job, Lee. Double thumbs up. Our second and final comment from today comes from Tanuj Aditya. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm just a dumb hick from the Midwest. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, Tanuj says, the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle, the Communist Manifesto. Yes, this is one of the most famous quotes from Marx, um, and Origins uh, shows that it is true, but it's often oversimplified, sometimes on purpose by bourgeois ideologues looking to dismiss Marx as being overly simplistic. Um, so a lot of people say that Marx was a class reductionist. You know, he believed only struggles, direct conflicts between two classes uh, were what influenced changes in society or what influenced the development of various societies. Um, but there are all sorts of different influential factors that Engels lays out in this book which affect the development of societies. All these factors are material. Um, they're all based on varying levels of production uh, or productive development. Uh, they're based on various different divisions of labor. They're based on the various geographic locations of different societies. Um, but all these developments bring about the development of new classes based on people's relations to the means of production. Uh, so what we mean is the increase in production eventually brings about an owning class, uh, a class who owns the means of production versus a class of the masses who are the toiling class, um, the class who works, the class who labors at the behest of the owning class. And we will see these classes develop uh, from slave-master class relations into peasant-serf class relations into capitalist wage labor class relations, at least in Europe. Um, so all of these developments in society that Ingalls is looking at, all these various developments based on various factors like division of labor um, and the environment that certain societies are in, um, these are all class developments. All of these developments in humans' productive capacity, their, their ability to produce what they need to survive, are inextricably intertwined with class and the development of class, uh, which leads to the development of different class interests, which leads to class antagonisms, which leads to class struggle, which is why all hitherto existing societies uh, is the history of class struggle. <laughs> so, yep, great comment there. Thank you for leaving that. Um, we didn't get too many questions on the last video, but that's all right. Maybe I just did such an amazing job of explaining everything. Um, but let those comments fly in the next, or questions and other comments fly uh, in the comment section below. I would love to answer more comments or criticisms in the next video. Uh, but either way, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time when we look at the, the origins of the nuclear family and the development of family forms uh, throughout the existence of human societies. Uh, so see you next time, fam. You get it? So we're, we're looking at family forms. I'm, I'm calling you all fam. Bye.